Dr. Eric's going to help us to um, better understand this, this whole idea with, of what ketamine is about, you know, how it works, you know, who can benefit from it, you know, and where it fits in this, you know, larger picture that we discuss every week, you know, about, you know, psychedelics and, and even the psychedelic assisted therapy. So brother, I'm so glad you're here. And um, so um, what do you want to share with us about ketamine? Right. Let me just get my screen arranged here. So yeah. I'm not staring off to the side. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so again, I, I've got a lot of different irons in the fire, uh, a lot of different hats that I'm wearing in addition to the medical director uh, role at SoulQuest, which I'm most grateful. Um, I work in an addiction treatment facility a couple of days a week. And I also have my own medical clinic. It's an outpatient infusion clinic, which I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, uh, just so you have an idea of, of what it looks like. Um, but what I primarily do there is IV ketamine infusions. I got interested in this space. Uh, gosh, we, we opened up about a little bit more than two years ago. I was working in the intensive care unit. I've been doing so for 16 years. I was really just burnt out. I was working too many hours. I have four school-aged children. I barely knew them. And I just cried out to my maker one late night on call, like, look, I'll do anything. Just show me what it is. Uh, I'll, I'll move into any field you want me to move into. And, and not long after, um, I read an article about how ketamine was being used to help people with these treatment resistant mood disorders. And, and I, it was just obvious that was the direction to go. It's a medicine that I had worked with in the ICU uh, for a long time, um, knew about it. And then I have had my own struggle with, with mood disorders. Uh, and I thought, gosh, what a, what a perfect intersection of something I know how to use as well as something that's really near and dear to my heart. And so, that's kind of how I got started in this area. And I want to just tell you a little bit about uh, the medicine. There's a lot of information out there. There's also a lot of misinformation out there, uh, as it is with many powerful medicines, be it, be it ketamine, the psychedelics, other things. Uh, so let's get started. So what will we talk about today? I'm going to talk about a little bit first about the depression, anxiety, PTSD, and what treatment, resistant, treatment resistance is. And we'll talk about ketamine how it works, is it safe? Are there any side effects short or long-term? What it's like to have an infusion or a lozenge? I saw a question come up in the chat box already about that. Uh, how quickly does it work? How long does it last? How much does it cost? Is it covered by insurance? What about this nasal spray that's out there, this nasal S ketamine? And then a little bit about my clinic too. So let's move ahead. So depression, anxiety, PTSD, extremely common in all parts of the world. It's not just a US thing, it's a worldwide thing. Most patients, meaning about three out of four patients get better with counseling and or medications. Uh, however, one in four do not, and that's what's called treatment resistance. Um, unfortunately, when you're treatment resistant, if medicines, counseling, other things aren't helping, typically what happens is you fall into hopelessness and despair. And that in the past, the only option in that situation was something called ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, where they basically plug you into the wall and shock it out of you. Um, <laughs> it's a little more humane than that. Uh, you are sedated uh, during the experience, but uh, it is expensive. Uh, it requires multiple treatments. It's often associated with significant memory loss, which is really scary. You might feel better, but you may not remember chunks of the experience or of your life. And then there's quite a bit of muscle pain associated with it as well. It's only offered in specialized centers and at best it's maybe 50 to 60% effective in resistant cases. So unfortunately, the end result of this treatment resistance is often suicide. And I know it is such a common phenomenon these days. I, I would venture to say that there isn't a single person out there who hasn't been touched in one way or another by suicide. Um, I've had so many suicides in my life. I've been close to the point of suicide myself several times. Mercifully, uh, I got help, uh, but you know, it doesn't have to be this way. There are other options. What is ketamine? So ketamine was developed a long time ago, about 60 years ago, actually now about 70 years ago. Uh, it was originally developed as an anesthesia for surgery or painful procedures. 
initially became really popular in Vietnam as a battlefield uh, anesthetic because it doesn't drop your blood pressure, it doesn't affect your respiratory rate. And so it was a great thing to use on the battlefield when they needed to anesthetize someone for, for a painful procedure or because they were just in such incredible pain. It's unlike any other, other anesthetic. It's not an opioid, it's not a benzodiazepine. It affects a receptor called the NMDA receptor. It antagonizes that receptor. NMDA is N-methyl-D aspartate glutamate receptor. So NMDA, much easier to say but it basically antagonizes that receptor. And in doing so, it, it launches a chain of events downstream that affect uh, your, uh, your synapses between cells. And I've got a slide later to get more specifically into that. Though the experience uh, under ketamine is very similar to psychedelics, the mechanism is totally different. Classic psychedelics work through the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor as opposed to the NMDA receptor, which ketamine works through. So though the experience may be similar, the neurochemistry is very different. In high doses, ketamine acts as what we call an anesthetic. It's given all at once. You dissociate, you have this out-of-body experience. You're basically checked out. I mean, you're there, your eyes are open, but nobody's home. Um, it's great for treating fractures or dislocations. Uh, it's used classically in the emergency department. If someone has a dislocated shoulder, they can give you a quick dose, pop your shoulder back in, and you're no worse for the wear and, and, and don't have to experience the pain. It is as if uh, you are so disconnected from your body that your body is no longer yours. And so the pain doesn't register because this, the pain is in someone else's body. Um, can also be really useful for painful dressing changes. I've, back when I was still working in, in the hospital, had to use this for some horrendous wounds that just made it really possible, a humane way to do uh, some of these dressing changes, which otherwise would have been intolerable. In low doses, so-called sub-anesthetic doses, either by infusion or lozenge, um, it's actually really, really effective for mood disorders. It's also helpful to process difficult emotions and trauma. And I'll talk about the different ways that it's used to do that. So low-dose IV ketamine infusions. This is for treatment-resistant mood disorders. Again, treatment-resistant, meaning that folks have tried a couple different antidepressants, maybe some talk therapy. It hasn't helped. Uh, studies about 18 years ago, people started noticing that people, clients who got this for an anesthetic, say for cardiac surgery or something else, they came out of their surgery a whole lot happier. Someone, I don't know who made the first observation, but you know, it was someone really astute apparently, and, and they picked up on it and they said, gosh, maybe there's something here. And so it led to a whole bunch of studies all done by major academic medical centers, um, Enough evidence finally accumulated that in April 2017, the American Psychiatric Association came out with a consensus statement saying basically, okay, enough is enough. We've got, we have plenty of evidence now. This is the real deal. This is how we should do it. This is who should do it. And this is what you can expect. Um, basically what the research has shown is that for three out of every four resistant cases, uh, that you actually get life-changing improvement. And it happens within days as opposed to weeks to months, as you see with traditional antidepressants when they do work. It's also really effective for suicidal ideation. So it's being used in some centers in the emergency department. If someone comes in and says, look, I'm really worried I'm gonna hurt myself. You know, I'm feeling low. I have the means to do this, like I need some help. Traditionally, what would happen in that situation? Well, you'd be admitted to the hospital for 72 hours and treated like you were crazy when all you really needed was some help. And so what they're finding now is actually in the emergency department, you can give an infusion right then and there. And one of the very first things to respond to this therapy is that suicidal ideation. So you get your infusion, you come out of, the, uh, out of it, uh, and hours later, you're like, okay, I think I'm all right now. Like, you know, the, the urge is gone. Uh, and so they'll get people plugged in without patient follow-up and they don't have to spend that 72 hours in the hospital, which again, could just be so demoralizing to have to be stuck in the hospital, looked at like you're crazy, maybe put in the back hallway somewhere in the emergency department. I mean, the exact opposite of what you need. You need love, closeness, warmth, support. And so this is a way to kind of facilitate that. 
So ketamine can also be used for certain types of chronic pain. I'm not going to get real deep into that today, but I just want to mention it because you may have heard of it. The classic thing that it's used for is a type of neuropathic pain called complex regional pain syndrome. And I actually have my acronym backwards there. It should be CRPS. Uh, and this is previously called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. So if you've heard of that, it's, it's the same thing. IV ketamine infusions work really well for that. It's a longer infusion. Um, it's a four hour infusion instead of a 40 minute infusion. Uh, it can also be helpful for other kinds of neuropathic pain syndromes. It's sometimes can be helpful for mechanical pain, but not as much. So if you've got a disc or something else in your back, your worn out joint, probably not gonna help you in that situation with the exception that pain and mood disorders have significant overlap and they both play into each other. And so if your pain is a lot worse because of your depression, many times treating the depression can make the pain seem much more tolerable. And so, so it's just something to keep in mind. But again, as I mentioned earlier, treating pain specifically, particularly these, these complex syndromes, these neuropathic pain syndromes, requires a much longer higher dose infusion and it's not the subject of our talk today. How does ketamine work? We talked a little bit about that NMDA receptor. Uh, I wanna talk uh, a little bit more about the prefrontal cortex and mood disorders. So the prefrontal cortex, it's the front part of your brain. It's the part of your brain that's right underneath your forehead. It's the part of your brain that's responsible for executive decision-making, it is also responsible for modulating your emotions. And so what neuroscientists have found is that in the setting of depression, anxiety, and PTSD, the front part of your brain isn't working as well as it should. Um, you have all these different nerve cells called neurons, and they're connected to each other by something called synapses. And what happens is these synapses, uh, many of them have kind of faltered away, they've atrophied, uh, they've broken down. And so there, there are fewer connections between neurons as, as well as less neurotransmitter being elaborated at these synapses. And so the, the prefrontal cortex just is not fired on all cylinders, if you will. It's not working as efficiently as it should. And therefore, the more primitive parts of your brain, the amygdala, the, the hippocampus, the parts of your brain that are responsible for survival, for fear, anxiety, hunger, reproduction, those parts of your brain just are, they're, they're working really, really well because they don't have the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex to tone them down, to chill them out, to modulate. Uh, so interestingly, ketamine by interacting with that NMDA receptor causes a series of downstream events that ultimately, excuse me, <laughs> that ultimately result in increased production of something called BDNF. Uh, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And it's kind of like brain fertilizer. You can imagine sprinkling fertilizer on the front part of your brain. What's going to happen? Well, if you put fertilizer on a shrub that maybe has been trimmed back and pruned, you fertilize it, what happens? It comes back out in even uh, richer, more luxuriant growth. And so that's basically what happens in the front part of your brain with ketamine. You get those synapses that were knocked out, that were gone, that weren't working right, they begin to flourish again and reconnect really, really quickly. And this is something called synaptogenesis, which means formation of synapses between neurons in the nervous system. This is what that looks like. Now, these are brain specimens from rodents. Uh, they, there is a rodent model of depression where the animals are uh, subjected to chronic stress and it results in a very similar picture uh, to that of depression in humans. Uh, the top part of the slide, this is a, a micrograph. The red part is the nerve cell, uh, the, the axon specifically, uh, which is a, a little arm that comes out from the nerve cell that reaches out to connect to the next cell. And what you can see uh, in there, you've got these little teeny tiny buds kind of coming off. They look like little red sprouts off the, this red strand. Those are the synapses. And as you can see, there aren't that many in the top slide. However, within hours of being given a dose of ketamine, uh, analogous to the dose we would use for depression, you begin to see new synaptic connections sprout off of this axon. And that's what you're seeing there in the bottom half of the slide, that picture where the arrows are indicating these new red blebs that are popping off of this axon. So within hours, you've got growth of new connections 
between cells in the prefrontal cortex, which makes that part of the brain work better than modulating emotions. Now, a little bit about chronic pain. So how does ketamine work in chronic pain? Chronic pain is associated with a variety of things, what we call central sensitization. So you become hypersensitized to pain. What might normally not hurt, say brushing the skin, touching an area becomes very painful. And this is called hyperalgesia. Um, there's another phenomenon called allodynia as well, but the idea that things that shouldn't hurt, hurt. Uh, and what happens when you're in chronic pain, these pain pathways are so used to firing that they almost fire automatically. It's like ruts in a road. You can imagine uh, a, a wagon path where the, the mud is very soft and the wagon wheels run through this pathway and then the earth dries out and you've got these ruts. And so the next time a wagon comes through, it is channeled straight through those ruts again, even if that's not where it wants to go. And that's uh, it's seen in chronic pain as well. These, these pain pathways get so used to firing that the, the road is just all rutted out basically. And what might not be painful feels painful. It's thought that ketamine helps to reset these pathways to kind of smooth that road back out again to allow for new pathways to be used. This is called neuroplasticity. It is the ability of the brain to form and reorganize synaptic connections, especially in response to learning or experience or following injury. So a couple of cool things there, synaptogenesis on one hand, neuroplasticity on the other. So ketamine, is it safe and are there any side effects? This is something that everybody wants to know about, of course. You don't want to put something in your body that's going to make you feel better in the short term, then the long term is going to do damage. So short term side effects, some very mild increases in heart rate and blood pressure. I'm talking about 10 points with either of these. So going a heart rate from 70 to 80 or a blood pressure from say 120 to 130. In practice, those are really inconsequential changes. Now, what is consequential is towards the very tail end of the infusion, about 10% of people get nausea. Uh, we ask you not to eat or drink for a couple hours before your infusion, because if this happens, uh, you know, we don't want you to end up in, in a pile of puke, if you forgive me. Um, it's usually really easily treated with Zofran or Phenergan. If, if we know that you have, uh, that you're really easily susceptible to nausea from medications, or if you get motion sick really easily, that's another indicator. And then we just treat you prophylactically or preventively up front before your infusion with Zofran or Phenergan. And that'll usually completely prevent the nausea. But if it does happen, it's easy to treat. The other thing that we do see happen is sometimes people get a little scared, a little freaked out. Uh, in the same way, you can see that with psychedelics too. And, and I'm sure many of us have felt that before. I know I have. Um, you know, that moment of panic where you just can't let go and you don't really know what's happening. Um, that can happen with ketamine too. It's usually pretty easy to walk people through it. It's just a matter of sitting with them, holding space, encouraging deep breathing down into the belly, up into the chest. You know, if that's not enough to get things settled down, we can pause the infusion for a little bit. That takes the edge off, slow the infusion rate down. That also helps. And in extreme cases, we'll give a small dose of a benzodiazepine, uh, Versed, it's kind of like Ativan, kind of like Xanax, uh, and that'll do it as well. Most of the time we don't need to do that. It's really, really uncommon. Long-term side effects. There's been no long-term side effects identified when used in clinical settings at the low doses that we use for mood disorders. Now, high dose infusions, which are used for those chronic pain syndromes, which is the much longer infusion, much higher dose, you can see some uh, problems with that. It can be very irritating to the bladder. And so some people can develop a condition called interstitial cystitis, which means inflammation of the lining of the inside of the bladder. It's very painful. Uh, it makes it feel like you've got to go to the bathroom all the time. Uh, it's thankfully not seen with mood disorder level of infusions. It's really just in those high dose chronic pain infusions. Um, there are some ways to minimize that risk when you're using those higher doses. It's not something that I'm involved with, but it pr primarily involves making sure people are really well hydrated and there are certain medications you can also take to kind of help uh, keep the bladder to be less sensitive to the irritating effects of the medicine. Now, the drug itself is not physically addictive. People ask about this, especially folks who are in recovery or maybe have struggled with addiction in the past. 
the drug itself is not physically addictive, but it can definitely be abused. And I've met people that that was their drug of choice. They drain their bank accounts and they ruin their lives uh, chasing that ketamine high. And so I don't want to say there's no risk at all to this drug. Um, it doesn't tend to tweak dopamine, dopamine the way most drugs of abuse do, for instance, methamphetamine, cocaine, opioids. Uh, and so it is not as high of an addiction potential, but it's just something to be aware of. If someone comes to me and, and they're like, look, you know, I have a treatment system mood disorder, but ketamine was my drug of choice before, I'm probably not going to treat them with ketamine. I'm probably going to find another way, maybe steer them more towards psychedelic it's assisted, assisted therapies, this sort of thing, because ketamine probably wouldn't be a good choice for that client. But again, it's very individual, depends on where they're at. Um, you know, even people who have had opioid addictions can use opioid pain medications in acute settings when they have acute pain. There's just certain steps that have to be taken to make sure that they're okay, that they stay in the middle of the boat and that they don't go back out and relapse. And so it's, it's never a hard no, it really depends on where people are at, but it's just something to be aware of. So what is a ketamine infusion like? I'm going to tell you the logistics first, and I'm going to tell you the subjective experience. Getting back to this idea of mood disorder, these mental health infusions, um, it is a 40 minute infusion. There's two phases to the treatment. When you first come in to see me, uh, when we're figuring out if ketamine works for you and, and how it's going to work, the, the, we use what's called the loading phase, which what that involves is six 40 minute infusions over a two to three week period. Why do we use six 40 minute infusions? That's the protocol that was developed over time and all these academic medical centers doing the research that they found out they can get the best benefit in terms of mental health uh, over the shortest period of time and you get people feeling better quickly. And this is the way to do it. So you basically load people over a short period of time. Uh, this can be spaced out as far as four weeks apart. If you do it more spaced out than four weeks apart, you don't get the stacking effect with the infusions. And so it's really best in that loading phase to just you stack one on top of the other on top of the other to get the best benefit and the most durable benefit as well. Now, assuming ketamine works for you, which again, it does for three out of four people who are in that treatment resistance category, assuming it works for you, once you're out of the loading phase, you do a maintenance infusion approximately once a month, one 40 minute infusion once a month. Now you come in, it's really kind of fun actually, because people have gotten better. They come in to see me a month later, just for their booster infusion. And they're like, doc, I'm doing great. I get to hear about how wonderful things are going on in their lives. I mean, really, it's, it's actually kind of a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy working in this space because most of the people who come through my door I can get them better. And that's not the case in a lot of medicine and with a lot of diseases. Um, there's a lot of things that we just can't do anything about, or, or maybe we can, but only in a small percentage of people. Uh, now, again, this works for three out of four. It's that one out of four that are tricky. I have some other things for them. We'll talk about those later in the presentation. Uh, but but it's, uh, it does make it challenging. I wish I had a test so that when someone comes through the door, I could just do a little finger stick and say, ah, you're going to be a responder and then you're not a responder. It would save a whole lot of time and money. Uh, there just isn't any kind of test out there. Folks have tried to figure out in terms of neuroimaging, uh, brainwave testing, genetics, and at least so far, no one's figured out like a way to figure it out ahead of time. I'm sure in time we will. It's probably going to be genetic testing would be my guess. Uh, it just hasn't been developed yet. So uh, importantly, when you're undergoing these treatments, you continue to take your usual medications. So if you're already taking Prozac or Paxil or Robutrin or whatever you're taking, you continue to take those medicines until we get you better. Once you're better, working together with your psychiatrist, your primary care doc, or your counselor, whoever's part of your care team, we can then begin to look at, okay, maybe we can start to peel back some of these medicines. Because let's face it, every psych med has side effects. Some side effects are trivial and minor and not noticed, and other side effects are pretty significant. Say, for instance, the serotonin agents, the, the SSRIs, Many people experience what you call emotional blunting with them. And so they don't feel the pain anymore. They don't feel the sadness, but they also can't really feel joy. They kind of live their lives in this really compressed box where they're missing out on, on the flavors of life, emotionally condensed, emotionally restricted. 
I've experienced that myself when I was on SSRIs and, and came off of them and then went back on. And I realized while I was on them, I couldn't cry, which sounds like, oh, that'd be great. I don't, I cry all the time, right? I want to stop crying. No, what I've actually found is I need to cry. And if I can't cry, it hurts. It actually causes me more pain because I need that release. And so that effect of emotional, emotional blunting um, can kind of feel checked out or numbed out. And you may not even know it until you've actually walked away from those medicines um, and, and felt your emotions again and realized that we actually really need to be able to feel to, to enjoy life. So anyway, um, the point is if and when you do get better with ketamine, we can begin to look at peeling back some of your medicines, but it isn't unusual for people to need to still stay on some of their medicines. But I try to get people on the lowest dose possible, again, to try and just eliminate as many side effects as possible uh, so that our brains can be the way they're meant to be instead of drugged up. So getting a little bit more into logistics, and then I'll tell you about the subjective, subjective effects. When you come in for an infusion, your first appointment is typically a two-hour appointment. The first hour is just get to know each other, doing history and physical, a chance for you to ask any questions. The second hour is the infusion itself. We typically run a range of about 0.5 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram over a 40-minute period. Sometimes we'll do that over 60 minutes, particularly for people who are requiring higher doses. It tends to be a little more tolerable. Uh, you come in, you sit in a chair, kind of like you see in this picture here. It's a reclining massage chair, uh, which is super comfortable. Sometimes things are slow at the clinic. I'll go sit in the chair for a while. Uh, but we darken the room, either low lighting or no lighting, depending on your preference. We have Google speakers in all the rooms, so we can play any kind of music you want. Uh, typically relaxing, soothing music is what people choose, although I have some people that will listen to you know, crazy heavy rock stuff. I have one guy that likes German marching music. Um, incidentally, if you're a Pink Floyd fan, Dark Side of the Moon is 42 minutes long. It's the perfect length of time for a ketamine infusion. And it's an amazing experience. I've seen so many people uh, go through their, their infusions with that and really come out you know, doing quite well on the other side. Subsequent appointments are about an hour and 15 minutes each. It takes you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes initially when you come in to get set up, get checked in, get your IV started, 40 minutes for the infusion, another 15 minutes for recovery. Yes, of course, didn't mention that. How long does it take to recover after your infusion? Well, in about 15 or 20 minutes after your infusion is done, you're actually ready to stand up, walk out, and go home with your ride. You do have to go home with the ride. You can't drive for at least three hours after the infusion. You used to say 24 hours. I mean, the drug just doesn't last that long. Those are lawyers talking there. And forgive me, there are lawyers in the crowd. I don't want to tar and feather lawyers, but they, they tend to make things complicated. <laughs> anyway, um, what I have found is about three to six hours. By then, typically, you're ready to drive again. But ideally, um, rather than risking it, we just everybody has to have a ride. Uh, and so you get, but again, within 15 or 20 minutes of your infusion, you're ready to get up and go home with your ride, which is really nice. So there isn't this prolonged recovery. As I mentioned earlier, we don't want you to eat for four hours beforehand. We generally say don't drink for two hours beforehand. We want you to have that empty stomach. So in case you do get nauseous and throw up, it's not a big deal. Uh, it's not all over yourself, all over the chair, all over the floors or the wall, because uh, nobody wants to do a cleanup on L9. Um, Again, got to have someone to drive you home too. All right, so what does it feel like? This is what most people want to know. So you start to notice the effects about 10 minutes into the infusion. And almost 100% of the time, people will look at me and they'll say, oh, this is weird. Is that normal? <laughs> I can't tell you how many times. It's like the exact phrase. I don't know why it comes out that way. But the answer is yes, it's weird and it's totally normal. Um, it is a floaty, dreamlike state. Colors are often very intense, uh, whether your eyes are opened or closed. Sounds are enhanced. Uh, the, the closed eyes visuals are very vivid, a lot like psychedelics. Um, thoughts are often described as being like a slideshow or one of those old uh, viewfinders where you click the thing and it would advance to the next slide. And so you can kind of move from, from scene to scene to scene. Sometimes the scenes seem completely unrelated and random. Um, what definitely happens is it becomes hard to speak. If you 
if you have someone in the room with you during your infusion, that person feels the need to keep holding a conversation with you, you're going to get to the point at about the 10 to 15 minute mark where you just get tongue tied. Like the words are there and they won't come out and it becomes frustrating. Word finding becomes difficult. And so I always encourage people to go within, to don't feel like they have to entertain their sitter or to hold a conversation. It's best to just be quiet, listen to the music and go within. Again, familiar advice if you've been on a psychedelic journey before. I and mean, that's what we tell you, stop talking and start looking inside. Um, your, your body typically feels like it's not yours and your consciousness feels separated from the body. That's called dissociation. Uh, it can be really strange as people will sometimes touch their face or their arms or their hands and not, it just doesn't feel like your own body. It's a very strange sensation. But again, if you can anticipate it and know it's part of the experience, it's not a scary sort of thing. You just know, okay, that's, that's the drug. I know it's the drug. Um, for most people, this is an incredibly pleasant experience, just dreamlike, restful uh, adventure. Uh, for a few people, it can cause anxiety. And I mentioned that earlier, there are ways to get people through that. It's not a big deal. Um, I think, gosh, I've done a couple thousand infusions over the last two years, and I've only had maybe three, four, five people total that like, after the first one or two infusions, you're like, that's it, I'm done. I never want to do that again. Um, pretty much everyone else, you could even real high anxiety, difficult, you know, high controlling people, you can get them through it uh, if you know how to finesse it and you know how to prepare them in advance. Uh, sometimes the infusions uh, can be intensely cathartic with a shedding of tears and releasing of past grief. And when I see that, it is such a beautiful thing just like the kinds of catharsis that we see in ceremony with psychedelics, it's a similar thing with ketamine. When it happens, it almost invariably means people are gonna get better. And it's just as if this store, this life store of pain finally gets a chance to come out. And when that happens, it's such a beautiful thing. It really is. Um, it, it makes people worry at first if you don't tell them about it, because they're like, look, this is supposed to be the happy juice. Why am I crying? Why did I have so much pain come out? And the answer is, because it needed to come out. And that is the path to healing. That is the path to happiness and contentment by letting go. And so if that happens, not a bad thing. Um, it doesn't happen the majority of the time, but when it does, again, I just really welcome it and celebrate it. I mentioned earlier, after the infusion stops, you're pretty much back in your normal space in about 15 or 20 minutes. You might feel a little fuzzy headed, um, slightly off balance when you walk, but again, you're able to walk um, some folks, particularly older folks, they may be a little bit tired the rest of the day or maybe even the following morning. It always clears. It's not a permanent side effect. You're not going to be fuzzy headed for the rest of your life. Uh, it does indeed clear up. Uh, so I always make sure to warn people about that. There was a question earlier about ketamine lozenges. So let me talk a little bit about that. It, uh, there are a variety of different ways to use ketamine lozenges. You know, lozenge is just like a hard candy, basically. Uh, it, I use it to lengthen the time between IV infusions. Most people need a booster infusion once a month. Some people go two or three months. I have a few people that have to come every two or three weeks, however, and that's a lot of money and so a lot of time. Sometimes it's just hard to find rides. Um, I have some clients that travel three, four hours to come see me. And so if they've got to do that every two weeks, it's just too much. And so uh, what, what people have found and what I've confirmed is that if we use these lozenges at home, that actually can lengthen the period of time between IV infusions by about 50 to 100%. So if you're on a two-week schedule, we can maybe get you out to a one-month schedule. A one-month schedule maybe get you out to a month and a half to two months. So it can be really handy to, to help make having to come into the clinic less frequent. How do we use these? It's done twice a week, approximately two hours before bedtime. You should have no responsibilities pending. You shouldn't have a pizza in the oven. You don't need to go walk the dog afterwards. I mean, you're done for the night, basically. It's placed underneath the tongue. It's allowed to dissolve and absorb. So you don't chew it, you don't swallow it. You just let it dissolve into the tongue. It dissolves in about 10 minutes. In that same period of time, you begin to feel the effects. Most people describe it as very mild and relaxing. A number of clients have said it's a lot like taking a Xanax, which 
I know many of you tried. Um, thankfully, it's not like a Xanax and that once the Xanax wears off, you want even more. Uh, the entire session with a lozenge lasts about an hour. Afterwards, most folks uh, will just uh, get up, do what they need to take care of themselves right before bed and then go to sleep. I do encourage people to journal if they're in a journaling mood. Uh, if not that night, do so the following morning. Uh, just like working with psychedelics, it's really important to capture what gets revealed during the session so that you can work with it and integrate it later. Now, I do have a few clients that find the lozenges just a little bit stimulating and they're not able to sleep for several hours afterwards. And so those folks, I'll have them use their lozenges during the daytime instead. I have one client that likes to do her lozenges in the late afternoon in the backyard, actually, and just really connects with nature that way. It's a safe space that's well uh, confined, and, and she just finds that to be the way that really helps for her. So used in this way, as I mentioned, we can really increase the time between IV infusions. There are some clinics that use this as the primary therapy, especially for people who can't afford IV therapy. It's not as effective as IV therapy because the dose isn't as high, but for some people it can be enough. And so it is an option. Uh, it is less expensive than IVs, uh, but my experience has been that for the really treatment resistant cases, you really do need those IV infusions intermittently to get you back up to that point where you're really thriving. One corollary to the lozenge therapy is something called ketamine-assisted therapy. And what I've described up to now is just coming in, getting your IV infusions, letting the medicine do its thing and going home. There's no actual therapy associated with that. There's no talk therapy that's done with it. Uh, but there's plenty of places, including our clinic, that we do offer talk therapy as well. Now with the IV infusions, you, you typically, you, never, you wouldn't want to do talk therapy during, again, you're tongue-tied, but even, in the recovery phase afterwards, typically people are just a little worn out and it's hard to, even after your head is cleared a little bit, to have that kind of dialogue that, that can be helpful. However, lozenges can actually work really well this way. And so you plan on a two hour clinic session. The first hour the client comes in, they sit in the chair and they do their lozenge, they chill in the chair, listen to music, do the whole eye shades thing, all of that. Um, it's not nearly as intense as an IV infusion. It, it, you just, you dissociate some, but not like you just, it's just not the same intensity of effect. However, it is very heart opening and it does lower the ego defenses and makes it really easy after that first hour in the second hour to, to do some really good therapy. Uh, and so taking a chance to talk, explore issues, work through trauma, it's a way to really touch on things that normally would be far too scary to go to. Uh, it just makes it possible to, to open up and be vulnerable where you couldn't do that before. And so it's a way to supercharge therapy. It's called ketamine assisted therapy or cat therapy. Um, uh, these acronyms people come up with here. Uh, if you like cats, it's a good thing. If not, maybe it should be dog therapy, but again, I, I'm not a comedian and you can tell there's a good reason for that. <laughs> anyway, um, so how quickly does ketamine work? I've alluded to it, but let's get into specifics. Most people notice mood improvement within a few days. Most know by their third infusion in that loading phase, if they are benefiting, that's the average. Now, some people will notice it after the first one or two infusions. And some people, it takes all six infusions before they finally notice a difference. And what I'm doing as you're coming in for each of those visits, during the loading phase, if you're not noticing a difference, I'm going up on the dose. So I start typically at a half milligram per kilogram. If by the time you're coming in for your third infusion, you're not really feeling or noticing even something subtle, I'm going up and I continue to go up. Typically I'll max out at about a milligram and a half per kilogram. Occasionally I'll go up to about two milligrams per kilogram, depending on the client, how much they can tolerate. Um, it, it's just, there is a lot of art to this in addition to the science. And so really kind of having a sense of where people are at, what they can handle, where you need to go. Uh, but some people, it takes all six infusions. And some folks, even at it, what I'll do is I'll call them a week after their sixth infusion and just say, hey, is this working for you? And at that point, they're like, oh yeah, the fine, that, that big dose you gave me the last time, they finally did it. 
uh, or you know what, Doc, I'm not feeling anything. I, I just, and that's where that's the hard part. It's just how to say, okay, this medicine isn't going to work for you. And I'm really sorry, but I'm glad that we tried. That's really hard. Um, it, it's hard for the client. It's hard as a provider because you really get to know folks during that six infusion, two to three week period. Uh, they often bear their souls to you. Um, Again, having walked through these spaces of anxiety and depression and my own trauma, uh, I want desperately to help people get better. And when I can't, it's yeah, it's heartbreaking. Um, fortunately, there are other options, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, but but at least in the ketamine space, uh, one out of every four, or one out of every four people will come through my doors. I have to have that hard conversation with them. It's, it's just it's heartbreaking. Um, but. Thankfully, we do have other things to offer, specifically psychedelics, but we'll talk a little bit more about that on another slide here or two. Um, when this works, it's not subtle. In a lot of antidepressant trials, they'll show, okay, the change in your depression rating scale went from a 20 to a 16, and, and that's defined as a benefit. Well, clinically, a change, for instance, on the PHQ-9, which is a depression scale, if you go from a 20 to a 16, you probably don't even feel the difference. Numerically, it's there, but in terms of how your heart feels, where you're at with your life, with your hopelessness, with your despair, you're not feeling the difference. And so when ketamine works, it's big changes. It's going from on a PHQ-9 of a 20 or 25 down to a five or 10. I'm looking for big, dramatic, life-changing effects, not subtle, not something that is just like, eh, I kind of feel better. now. we're looking for big differences. And that's what you see in three out of four people, which just makes it really cool. You can see it when people walk in the door. When the first day they come in the door, their eyes are downcast. They can't look you in the face. Uh, you can just tell, I mean, life's been heavy on them. And when they've started to respond, they come in the door, they're smiling. You can sometimes tell and they like, put themselves together. Um, they look you in the eye. Uh, and you see that spark of hope back. And that's really cool when you see it. I love it. It's like, I don't even need to give you the scale to tell you're feeling better, but we do anyway, so we can track those kinds of improvements. I mentioned earlier how this is being used in the emergency department for suicidal ideation. Um, talked a little bit also about for non-responders that you know, if you're increasing the dose, there's definitely some people that just need that higher dose. But remember that in one out of four, it doesn't matter how high a dose you go, it just won't work. And so Three out of four, it does. One out of four, it doesn't. But when it does work, it's generally pretty quick. Unfortunately, ketamine, for the most part, IV ketamine therapy is not covered by insurance. Now, that's beginning to change, thankfully. Uh, where that comes from, well, of course, insurance companies don't want to pay for anything they don't have to. Um, despite clear proof that IV ketamine works, there isn't an FDA indication for it. Now, why you say, well, what do you mean there's no FDA indication? Well, to get an indication for a medication, you have to do a certain number of clinical trials in a certain way and apply for the indication through the FDA. Doing those types of large clinical trials uh, through the FDA um, costs a lot of money. If you're going to do it, you're going to hope that you, if you get the indication for the drug, someone else isn't going to be able to use that same drug and market it and steal your market share. Um, the thing is, this drug is generic. It's been around forever. And so you can't patent the drug. You can't get an exclusive indication for it. Because say you're awarded the indication, there's nothing to keep generic drug maker X from offering it at a lower price and basically stealing your market share. And so there probably will never be a, a true FDA indication for it, even though there's overwhelming evidence that it actually does work. So insurance companies, for the most part, are refusing to pay for it, saying it's experimental. It's experimental because there's no FDA indication. Well, that's just a bunch of crap. I'm sorry, but it is. There's plenty of evidence, uh, but unless their arms are twisted, they're not gonna pay for it. Now, arms are beginning to get twisted. Some companies are beginning to pay at least partially. Uh, it's very company uh, specific. It's sometimes very person specific. A company will pay for it for one client and not for the other. Uh, you know, I tell people plan on it not being covered, but we'll do what we can to help it help you get it covered. Uh, what we've done and what's recommended by the National uh, Ketamine Advocacy Groups is to, for the, the individual charge for that day that you split it into the office visit and the infusion charge itself, 
Many companies will pay for the office visit, but not for the infusion, since the infusion is the part that's considered experimental. Uh, but some are actually covering the whole thing. Uh, we provide you with a super bill and a way to very easily file an out-of-network claim to try and get reimbursement. You can also use uh, flexible spending account or healthcare saving account money. So that's a way to, again, make it less expensive. We anticipate that eventually insurance companies will cover this, but it's going to be a slow process, probably in the same way that when we get uh, the ability to use psychedelics in therapy legally, that initially insurance companies probably are not going to pay for it, but eventually they will. And so there's going to be a, a, a great need for advocacy uh, on the parts of uh, people who struggle with treatment-resistant mood disorders. Uh, and I think it'll happen, but it's, it's gonna take some arm twisting, a lot of political pressure. And so it's important that we, we all speak up uh, as much as possible to those who can make that decision. So what are the costs? Um, I can give you, I don't know where that red line came from. I must've made a mark on the screen. Anyway, <laughs> there's a squirrel in the room and I just noticed it. <laughs> Uh, so what are the costs? I can only tell you about the costs in my clinic. Um, for the HMP and first infusion, it's a little less than $500. Subsequent infusion, it's $349. We charge two to three times what less what most people charge, particularly in large cities. You can see some pretty exorbitant prices being charged. People still commonly say, oh gosh, it's so expensive. Can't you make it less expensive or more accessible? This is, I mean, we're, we're offering as low as we possibly can. It's still an IV infusion with an anesthetic medication that potentially can cause serious effects acutely. Uh, and so it does uh, require that, you know, a doc be in-house, that you have people that are ACLS trained and this sort of thing. Uh, but we're doing what we can to get it as less expensive, as least expensive as possible and to try and get you re insurance reimbursement. Um, remember, this is for treatment resistant cases. So if you're depressed, you've never tried a typical antidepressant, um, try those first because, you know, like generic Wellbutrin, for instance, I mean, you can get 90 days worth for about 20 bucks. If that works for you, don't bother with this. It wouldn't make any sense. But for the people who just have not been able to get help and relief, um, this is what it's being used for. And so it's you know, saving it for those more difficult cases. And remember, other things that are used in this situation, like electroconvulsive therapy, very expensive and time consuming, even much more expensive than this. And so I don't wanna minimize the costs here. I realize it's a lot of money, it is. Um, and it's the single biggest hurdle to getting people help with this medicine. But, but recognize when it's used in treatment resistant cases, it, it can be life-changing and the money worth it. Everyone asks about Spravato. This is the nasal ketamine spray. It's actually nasal S-ketamine. Where does the name come from? Well, ketamine itself is actually a mixture of two different molecules. There's a right-handed form of the molecule, which is called R-ketamine, and there's the left-handed form of the molecule called S-ketamine. It's just a chemistry naming. The R and S enantiomers is what it's called. And so S-ketamine is actually S-ketamine. <laughs> I don't know how they came up with this name. Um, it's not a new molecule at all. All the manufacturer did is basically just say, well, let's take one half of the ketamine molecule and we'll test it to people in a nasal sprayer. And so that's exactly what they did. Um, what Unfortunately, what's been discovered is that neither the R nor the S in antimer is as effective alone as it is when it's combined. And so... Johnson & Johnson developed this nasal spray, Spravato. They did some five clinical trials that were to get FDA approval for this novel medicine, novel in quotes. Um, only two of the five studies actually showed any clinical benefit. And the clinical benefit was actually somewhat small. And, and even the overall percentage benefit, you know, again, with, with IV ketamine, we can see about 75% of people get better. They saw something more about 50% of people getting better with the nasal spray, which isn't terrible. I mean, that's half of the people get better, um, but half don't. Um, the nasal delivery itself is a little challenging. Imagine if you've got, you know, a lot of trouble with allergies, if it's, you know, pollen time of the year here in Florida, for instance. I mean, uh, if you've got all that gook there, it's kind of hard to get the, the medicine to be absorbed. Uh, what folks initially thought was, oh, I'll take this nasal sprayer home. I can just go home and use it that way. Well, the FDA 
in the approval said, no, it has to be used in the clinic. And so you still have to come into the clinic, you do your spray, you sit for two hours being observed, and then you go home. You don't get to take the medicine home with you. And so it doesn't get rid of that need to come into the, the clinic and be seen. Interestingly, it's really expensive. The, the way it was priced, uh, even with insurance coverage, it's often more expensive out of pocket than it is for you to do an IV infusion once a month. And this was really surprising. Um, I could get on a soapbox about the greediness of pharmaceutical companies. I realize pharmaceutical companies offer a lot of really beneficial things to humanity, but this was clearly just a big grab at money with a, a medicine that's not as effective as what's already out there. And that's not even really a new molecule. And so I, I have a fair amount of disdain for Johnson & Johnson, the way they manage this. Um, but it is what it is. All right, I promised a little bit about psychedelic assisted therapy. Uh, um, I've given another talk about this, uh, the previous SoulQuest uh, service. Uh, we can get you the links to that, um, or you can find it uh, on the SoulQuest website as well. Uh, lessons are taped, uh, but I do at least want to mention it. So um, as you know, you're on this session here today, you know about psychedelics, it's not some great mystery, uh, but let me just remind you, there's strong evidence now, strong evidence that the classic psychedelics, things like psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca, um, as well as some of these additional psychedelic-like medications, MDMA or ecstasy, they are incredibly effective for treatment-resistant mood disorders, depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, they're actually helpful for addictions, which is something I'm super excited about because I'm an addiction medicine doctor as well. And you know, the traditional model of treating addiction does not always work. Relapse is incredibly common. And if you can use a medicine like ayahuasca or psilocybin or something else as part of a structured program to help people get over their addictions, to begin able to see from a different perspective. And, and I mean, my own experience has been coming to the point where I see myself and I love myself so much that the thought occurs to me, why would I ever wanna treat myself that way? Why would I ever wanna put a substance like that in my body ever again, knowing what it does to me? Uh, and so what a beautiful way to help people recover uh, instead of telling them that they're bad or they just have to say no, but to instead help people from within say no. I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, so a um, bit of a tangent there, but it's a passion of mine. Having struggled with addictions myself, I'm in recovery for a little more than four years. Uh, I, I want to help people out of that same pit that I was in. Um, other places where psychedelics are clearly showing benefit, uh, end of life existential distress. You get a terminal diagnosis, you can take the time that you've got left. Say you got six months left to live. You can live that time wonderfully or you can spend it in fear and trepidation and worry. And if we can use a medicine to help relieve that worry and help you make the most of the time that you have left, what a good death that can be. And so psychedelics have so much promise there. Uh, there are legitimate large scale phase two, phase three studies being done, working with the FDA and the DEA to get approval for these medicines uh, what we're probably going to see first is, is psilocybin, the, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Uh, also going to see MDMA as well. Those two medicines will probably be available for clinicians to treat people in about two years. That's kind of what, what it seems like the time scale is on. Um, there's a lot of decriminalization movements going on now too, and so the medications will be more broadly available. Uh, but in terms of be, having a licensed therapist that can actually administer this medicine as part of the program, I think we'll see FDA approval here in about two years. The cool thing about psychedelics, as opposed to traditional antidepressants, or even as opposed to ketamine, is that it only takes about one or two, at most three sessions with these medicines for folks to get better if they're going to be responders to these medicines. And the effects are durable, which is really cool. Maybe I don't have to take a pill for the rest of my life, or maybe I don't have to do ketamine infusions once a month. Maybe I can just do a few ceremonies with a powerful medicine like ayahuasca 
and be better for good. That's cool. That's something I'm so excited about. Uh, I'm actually doing some training in this area now. There are several programs around the world you can train in. I'm doing one that's called CIIS, the California Institute of Integral Studies. MAPS, um, Multidisciplinary Association for Psych Psychedelic Studies, they offer similar training. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing what I can now to be prepared so when, when I can legally work with these medicines, I have something to offer the people in my practice that don't respond to ketamine or maybe something to offer them even before they try ketamine. Uh, it's all about having options, tools, things, because not every person will respond to every medicine. And so I'm just so excited about what's going on. I'm sure many of you have heard um, Oregon this past um, election cycle, they passed a bill which basically decriminalized all drugs in Oregon. So no longer will we be locking people up for possession or use, locking people up for their addictions where they can't get the help that they need. Instead, the money that was being spent on law enforcement, we spend on helping people, providing treatment if they need it, if they want it. And interestingly, here in Florida, a very similar bill that mirrors Oregon's approach was introduced uh, recently by one of the representatives from down in the Miami area. And the word on the street is that this won't pass the first time around, just like the uh, medical cannabis laws didn't pass the first time around here in Florida, but it's thought that in time, Florida and many other states, probably in the same way that we saw medical cannabis come to legalization, probably see the same thing happen uh, with medicines uh, such as psychedelics. So um, talked about next two to three years, I expect therapeutically we'll be able to use these in addition to just decriminalizing the medicines. Um, we already can use ayahuasca and peyote here in the US under religious use exemption. You know that if you've been to SoulQuest, that's the whole reason why SoulQuest can, can exist because there is protection through the religious use exemption uh, so that this isn't an illegal activity at all. Uh, and we're so blessed to have that available. Um, members of the Native American church can work with peyote in a similar fashion. Uh, the one drawback about peyote is it's, it's not on the endangered status now, but it's definitely a, an at-risk plant medicine. It's been over-harvested, and uh, it is just not as prevalent as it used to be. And so uh, just like we must work to preserve the plants and ensure their survival for ayahuasca, uh, the same thing must happen with peyote, but peyote is actually under much more stress at this point than, than ayahuasca is. Um, conversely, psilocybin mushrooms, but you can grow them just about anywhere. Um, so they're not at any kind of danger, risk of loss, thankfully. Um, but it's just important to be respectful of these medicines and know that they are gifts and that we have to do what we can to make sure that they're available for all of those generations that come after us because they too will need their help. Um, the key for all of these medicines, whether it's ketamine, psychedelics, is that you've got to have adequate preparation beforehand, support during, and then the all important integration afterwards. If you don't work with what's been revealed during these sessions, you're gonna miss the whole benefit of the experience. The medicine is just one small part of it. The integration afterwards, doing the hard work, that is the piece that leads to lasting recovery. And without that, you're really missing out on the benefits of these medicines. So uh, I mentioned the training I'm doing. I wanted to just briefly mention the clinic. We're in Ocala, it's called the Infusion Clinic of Ocala. We're between Orlando and Gainesville. It's like walking into a spa you can see the pictures here. Uh, we don't want it to feel like a, like a sterile clinic. We want it to feel like coming home. Um, all the rooms are private. We have the heated massage chairs. I mentioned the dimmable lights, really cool artwork in all the rooms, music. We have plenty of openings. So if you're interested in coming to see us, we can get you in. Typically you call, we can get you in the next day, sometimes even the same day. There's the information in terms of the websites, phone numbers, when we're open. Uh, we're not open on the weekends, we're not open on Tuesdays, but we're open all other days. In summary, treatment assistant mood disorders are incredibly common. They significantly reduce the quality of life for everyone involved and sometimes lead to loss of life, unfortunately. Ketamine therapy really does offer hope. It is rapid acting and it helps to repair the front part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex that's not working right. Uh, 
ketamine's legal status, the fact that it's a medical approach and its short duration of action make it really handy right now and very much available for a lot of people, particularly if folks are fearful of psychedelics. It can also be used as a bridge to psychedelics or for those in whom psychedelics don't work. Uh, and so I think ketamine will play a role even when the plant medicines are decriminalized or legally available. Um, I think ketamine will continue to play a role, but you know, like many things, you just you have to have lots of different tools in your box for helping people. And so ketamine will continue to be one tool in the box uh, that, that we'll have available to help folks. Um, however, the cost and the ongoing need for maintenance infusions makes it a little bit of a disadvantage. And so even though I'm in the business of providing ketamine infusions, ultimately I want people to heal long-term. And so, you know, whatever it is that works, um, it, I just want you to be better. And, you know, if I put my ketamine business out of business because psychedelics work so well, then so be it. And I will practice exclusively in the psychedelic space if that's what it takes. Um, so there are strengths and weaknesses to every medicine that we have available. And ketamine is just one of those. So with that, I end my presentation and I welcome any questions. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Yeah. Eric, thank you so much for that. What an amazing presentation. I got a couple of questions for you before we go into the questions that are in the chat. And you know what I was, I've had a couple of patients that have been working with ketamine and um, they were getting the, the intermuscular injections, the IMs. And I was wondering if you could speak to that in terms of effectiveness. You know, you talked about the lozenge, you talked about the IV, and you talked about the nasal spray. What about the IM injections? Uh, thank you for bringing that up. I you know, need to add that to the presentation. I did IM injections for a little while. Most of my clients who had done both IV and IM preferred the IV because it's it tends to be a much smoother onset. Um, when you do an, intra, an IM or an intramuscular injection, it hits really quickly. Uh, the muscular absorption, because the muscles are very full of blood vessels, it hits really fast and hard. So the peak goes up fast and then it also comes down fast. So it's, it's a big roller coaster ride. Now, the nice part about IM injections is it doesn't require starting an IV. Um, starting IVs, it's an art. It's an art I had to learn. I mean, doctors don't normally start IVs in the hospital. I'm actually really good at it now, thankfully. And I also have a really, really good medic that does most of my IVs. Um, but, you know, it's still an IV and, and needles scare people too. Um, if I can just give you a quick shot in the arm and you can do your thing, then great. It seems to work as well. Um, some clinics only do intramuscular injections. And it, you know, it seems to work as well. Again, it's just pharmacologically, it's a different experience. It's just the onset and offset is much more rapid. And, and when I've used it and done both approaches in the same client, most people prefer the, the IV. Mm -hmm. Similarly with the lozenge therapy, it's a much smoother onset, although the, the peak is not as high, but it's just much more mellow, smooth onset, smooth offset. Uh, yeah. But it's an option. It's definitely an option. You know, I know um, so a while back, you and I were having a conversation um, about when you, you mentioned the bridge to psychedelics. You know, when somebody is in a pretty heightened state of suicidal ideation, you know, they might be on their antidepressants. You're saying that a person can be on their SSRIs and still do ketamine? Excellent question. And yes. So fortunately, ketamine does not have drug interactions with any of the major psychoactive medications. Now, there are a few medicines that we have people hold their dose before they come in because it tends to be a blocker of ketamine's effects. Lamictal or lamotrigine, trileptal, um, any of the benzodiazepines, they tend to, and also neurotin too, gabapentin, it tends to block ketamine's effectiveness. And so we have people hold the dose immediately beforehand. But the rest of the medications, your Prozac, your Paxil, your Wellbutrin, any of that, people can continue to take that. Now, as a bridge, using ketamine as a bridge to psychedelics, because most psychedelics, you have to be off of those psych meds. You have to, either because of dangerous drug interactions or because the psych, the psych med itself, particularly the SSRIs, block the effectiveness of the psychedelic. In fact, they completely prevent the psychedelic experience because of the way they interact with that serotonin receptor. And so 
you know, you think, well, you just tell people well, you have to wean off your medicines before you do your psychedelic journey. Well, that's really hard. And many people either like, it's impossible, I'll never do it. Now, what if you use ketamine as a bridge to that? So you use ketamine, you get them feeling better, you help them come down off their psych meds, get completely off the ones that they have to be off of, um, or maybe off them all together. And so they could be ca- they can, so they could be titrating off of their psych meds mm-hmm. with while they're on ketamine while they're using yes. ketamine and in preparation for working let's say with ayahuasca so how you know we're talking about six weeks seven weeks so that'd probably be a, a pretty typical period of titration right exactly yeah for most now you know some meds particularly if you're only on one psych med now. People who are on two, three, four, that's a longer journey because you mm-hmm. to try and cut them all back at once can be really challenging for the person. Mm-hmm. But let's just say you had to come off one medicine, say Paxil or Wellbutrin. Uh, you can come off of those medicines typically pretty quickly over a two to four week period, uh, weaning off of them, depending on what dose you're starting on. Something like Prozac, you know, it takes weeks to wean off of Prozac. And even once you're off of it, you've got to be off of it for four to six weeks before you can even do your journey. Most other psych meds, you only need to be off for two weeks before you can do your psychedelic journey. Um, So with the exception of Prozac, uh, the rest of the medications, uh, you just sit down and you get a plan. And you say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. We work together with your psychiatrist or other providers. And let's get a plan for weaning down. We're going to be seeing each other frequently so we know if there's trouble. Uh, And in this way, we can bridge people to get to the point where they can work with the plant medicines in a way that hopefully is curative uh, rather than just slapping a Band-Aid on their symptoms. And is ketamine, you know, like Iboga and like with ayahuasca, it can be a real addiction interrupter. You know, a person can have a mystical experience and just, you know, um, you know, have a conversion experience and no longer have the interest in using, you know, substances. Um, does ketamine have that, you know, that interrupter kind of uh, aspect to it? It definitely can. And there are research studies that are underway right now, coupling ketamine with cognitive behavioral therapy uh, so that it, you know, helping people to step back, get that perspective, to see their disease from a different perspective, to develop a different relationship with their drug of choice. Uh, it can definitely be used that way. That evidence is just not as well developed yeah. at this point. This, the trials are still early, but they're promising um, in a variety of different things, smoking cessation, cocaine, alcohol. Um, I think there's actually stronger evidence right now of the use for psychedelics in that sort of a paradigm shifting, uh, addiction changing perspective. Uh, but I think either of the you know, ketamine and psychedelics can both be used in that way. Mm-hmm. I think one of the big things that I think about for ketamine is for those people that are really in that, um, you know, you know, uh, in the suicidal ideation, really high lethality, people that are just, you know, there's nowhere to turn. Um, the families are all distressed. It's like, what do we do? You know, getting a ketamine um, treatment can be life-saving. It can be that that moment where a person can be talked down off the ledge and things can really start to turn around. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Hey, Stephen, so what do we have in the chat? Oh, man. We, Dr. Dr. Eric, every time you come in, it's like questions just pile (laughs) in. I think it's because, you know, um, I called the uh, Orlando stand-up comedians and they would like for you to come and spend 10 minutes <laughs> uh, don't encourage me please do not encourage me i'm the king of dad jokes and puns and they're all corny i have books full of them my kids will testify and just roll their eyes like yeah it's a dad joke but hey that's the space i'm in now you know before i got into recovery and before i started working with these medicines all my jokes were inappropriate they were not polite <laughs> They were just crass and horrible. And and now I don't have to go there, thankfully. And I don't care if my jokes are terrible. I laugh at them, so who cares? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have, Stephen? Well, I'm going to start off on Facebook because we got a couple questions actually on Facebook as well. So um, the first one is uh, from a gentleman. He said he's pr- praying his meeting with his mother's psychiatrist goes well on Tuesday to receive this medicine. Uh, been caring for her now for three weeks after third suicide attempt since Christmas. Mm-hmm. Mother's been schizophrenic for 15 to 20 years with mm-hmm. PTSD, 
uh, severe depression, fibromyalgia, and a slew of other health elements. Her psych fears she may become psychotic. Her past hospitalizations have come from getting off psych meds and antidepressants, cold turkey, or coupled with drugs and alcohol. She's currently only uh, on Latuda and has been off antidepressants now for on, going on five weeks. Congratulations. Wow. And wow. his question is, as I'm meeting with psychiatrists to ask for recommendations, what should I be aware of? So, yeah, that is a great question. I'm so sorry that your mom is suffering. And gosh, um, to have any loved one that you care for in that kind of a space, uh, what a sense of powerlessness. Uh, you just want to put your arms around and hug them and love them and tell them that it's okay. But when you're in that pit of despair, it doesn't matter how many people are around you loving you. You just can't feel it. And you certainly can't feel it for yourself. Um, so I would just have an honest, open discussion with the psychiatrist with, with the presence of schizophrenia, it can be a little challenging. Um, it, you know, I know certainly in the psychedelic assisted therapy range, most of the time people say, you got if you have a history of schizophrenia or type one bipolar disorder, you got to stay away from these medicines uh, because they may be too activating. Uh, particularly with schizophrenia, the hallucinations may be too disorienting. Um, some folks will say that even if you have, um, dissociative disorders where, you know, because of your past traumas, you dissociate really readily. What I found at least those with dissociative disorders related to trauma, it tends to not be an issue just because I'm making them dissociate with ketamine. It doesn't cause a problem. Now I haven't, I've only treated a couple people with schizophrenia with the medicine. It seems to work. Um, now if they're actively hallucinating in a place where they're completely out of touch with reality, I would say absolutely not at that point. It wouldn't be the right thing to do. Uh, it would be get, get their schizophrenia under control first, and then we could work with the medicine. But, but by itself, it isn't a contraindication. It's just a let's pause, step back and think about where the person's at and, and what they're struggling with. Um, so it's a very individual decision, uh, but definitely be open-minded and ask questions. Not every psychiatrist is down with this. Um, just like not every psychiatrist is okay with psychedelic assisted therapies. Um, there are some, however, some very open-minded people out there. And I think as we move forward in time, we'll begin to see that more and more as well. I hope that answers your question. It, excellent answer, brother. So the next, uh, the next one off Facebook, uh, what is the, I think you already answered this. What is the ideal population? And then what does one have to have tried everything else first? So um, treatment resistance is the key and you don't have to try everything. In the clinical trials, their requirement to get in for ketamine therapy is that you've tried at least two different types of antibiotics. So I'm sorry, antidepressants yeah. um, at what they say the max dose. Now, you don't have to completely max out, but, but a reasonable dose as opposed to the starter dose. Um, and it ought to be in two different classes. So maybe an SSRI and then something besides an SSRI. Now I have people that come to me and they're like, look, Prozac or whatever medicine, it helped, but I couldn't tolerate the side effects. The side effects were horrible. I felt numbed out or I had sexual side effects or other things. And so I would also call that treatment resistance. That wasn't part of the original clinical trials. But I definitely have clients who come in and say, look, I can't take traditional antidepressants. I can't tolerate the side effects. Can you help me with ketamine? And we do. And so that's another group of people that this can be used. But if you come to me and you're struggling with depression and you've never tried anything, uh, I will encourage you strongly to try one of the traditional antidepressant medicines first. Try at least one to see. I, I've had clients come to me like that and I'll get them started. I'm a big fan of Wellbutrin just because it doesn't cause the emotional blunting that the SSRIs do, but try something first. And you may be able to sell yourselves a lot of time and money that way, uh, but I keep in close contact with those people. And if it's not working, or if they're just in such a difficult place that they just don't have the time to wait uh, a few weeks for these medicines to work, then yeah, let's get you started on ketamine, but let's maybe look at starting a traditional antidepressant too and see if maybe you don't need uh, the IVs, maybe we can get you by with something else. Uh, but it's very individual. Uh, and, and again, just recognizing the time and the money that this represents uh, for people. I mean, no one has too much time or too much money. Uh, and so I, I wanna be real sensitive to that. 
Well, anybody that has too much money can send some my way. I'd be happy to help. <laughs> <with that problem. laughs> yeah. Um, so how does, how does cannabis interact with K? Uh, would you recommend holding off cannabis for a set amount of time before a K treatment? Good question. The, the official recommendations are no cannabis on the day of your infusion. I have some clients that can't stick to that. It doesn't seem to alter the effectiveness of the medicine. I don't have a side-by-side -side clinical trial with, without to tell you, but at least those that cannabis is an important part of their medicine, an important part of their treatment. Um, I don't see that it really causes a problem. Um, now, cannabis does have a very strong energy. And so I wouldn't want you to come in baked for your infusion. I mean, at least give yourself a little bit of time so you're not coming in completely spaced out. Give the medicine it, itself a chance to do what it's going to do. In the same way that we recommend, you know, with psychedelics, we'll say you really ought to be off for two to four weeks. But I know some people can't adhere to that. Definitely don't use on the day of your ceremony. Why let the strong energy of cannabis interfere with the strong energy of psychedelics. And so the same thing with ketamine, that's my advice, but I do have some flexibility there because at least in terms of effectiveness with ketamine, I don't, I don't see a strong interaction. So don't chong on the way into your ketamine tree <laughs> is, the, is the headline there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, and then we got some stuff from the chat. We got a lot of questions. Uh, one of these I'm going to really mess up, Dr. Eric, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to understand me. How do you, do you know anything about gabapentin inhibiting synaptogenesis? I, I deserve a round of applause for that one. I think you got it all. Are you 100%, man? Passing grade. No, actually, excellent grade. Um, so it, I don't know that gabapentin inhibits synaptogenesis long-term, but I do know that gabapentin acutely inhibits the effect of ketamine. And so, you know, I can power through that if you, if you can't hold your gabapentin or neurotin is the trade name for it, I can give you a higher dose of ketamine, but then you're also more likely to have side effects in terms of nausea, um, dysphoria, this sort of thing. And so what I ask people to do is just, Hey, on the day of, don't take your dose before you come in. You can take it afterwards, just don't take it beforehand. And that seems to do the trick. It's the same thing with some of those other blocking medicines that I mentioned, the Lamotrigine, Lamictal, or Trileptal, um, and also with benzodiazepine, so your Xanax, your Valium, your Ativan. If you can hold the dose before you come in and then just begin taking it whenever your next scheduled dose would be, that usually does the trick. Now, benzos, you know, I have some people that if they hold their morning clonopin, they're gonna be in a mess. Uh, and so, you know, if you, if you're that client, then we'll figure it out, you know, take your normal medicine and we'll, we'll adjust the dose as necessary. We can get through it. Um, but you know, that, that's been my experience with those medicines. If you can hold it great, if not, we'll, we'll find a way to finesse it. Have you ever, have you ever led someone into breath work during an infusion, like holotropic Wim Hof, stuff like that? Oh, wow. Never had that question before. So I'm a huge fan of breathwork, holotropic breathwork specifically. That's what I've had a lot of experience with. In fact, that's where I did all of my non-ordinary states of consciousness work before I ever came to ayahuasca. Uh, and I've had some amazing transformative experiences with that. I have not encouraged people to do that during their ketamine experience. Uh, I just, I think it would be too much. Again, it's like trying to have a conversation in the middle of ketamine, you can't do it. And, and at least with holotropic breath work, it requires sustained focus attention to be able to stay in the breath space, to keep your breath, you know, doing it the right way you're supposed to. Uh, but I absolutely could imagine doing it earlier in the day or later in the day as part of a like a one, two punch. I think that would be a really powerful technique actually. Uh, I just haven't used it that way. Now, during the ketamine experience itself, if you're struggling to let go, if you're having trouble with anxiety or panic, I absolutely will use the breath, but, but only in the sense of doing just the deep abdominal breathing down into the belly, up into the chest, that kind of breathing, which increases your vagal tone, which slows the heart rate, which lowers your adrenaline, and which allows you to become centered and less scared. So I will use the breath therapeutically if needed, to help people get through their experience, but not as part of a, 
you know, during the session, really trying to do that, that hard, you know, breath specific, breath focused work. Great question. Yeah. So you spoke on ketamine bladder syndrome being avoided at low doses. What constitutes a low dose with ketamine troches? Treatments, I think is what they meant. Well, well, tro troches or troches is another word for the lozenge. I use the word lozenge because that troche just annoys me. It's a French word. It should be troche. And here in the U.S., we pronounce it troche, and it just bugs me. I'm sorry. It's a pet peeve. So I call them lozenges instead. Um, lozenges, the dose that you can only get about 200 milligrams of ketamine in a lozenge, and you don't absorb as much sublingually as you would IV. And so with lozenge therapy, particularly if you're just doing it twice, maybe three times a week, the likelihood of having trouble with your bladder is exceedingly low. The way to avoid it is to stay well hydrated because the medicine is eliminated through the urine. And so if you're super dehydrated, the medicine is very concentrated in your urine, it's more irritating. Same thing with IV infusions. Um, the dose we use is a half milligram to one and a half milligrams per kilogram. And at that dose, only once have I seen any kind of bladder irritation. It wasn't actually uh, an, an overt interstitial cystitis, which is a much more serious form of inflammation. Uh, but what I have found is that the person just comes in well hydrated and we even give them a little bit of IV fluid, an extra IV fluid during, and that completely eliminated the problem. Uh, so it's really about maintaining attention to proper hydration and also sticking with lower dose infusions. Now with the chronic pain infusions, we're using a much higher dose uh, over a longer period of time. And at, that, at those higher doses, the chance of interstitial cystitis is much, much higher. I don't have the exact percentages. I just know it's more common. Uh, I don't practice in that space. I initially did, and I found it to be really difficult to manage in the outpatient setting because people are so strongly dissociated. They're often anxious and combative, and it, was, it ended up being too much for us to safely handle in the clinic. Mm. Great answer. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Eric. So is there a reason to believe that ketamine can effectively treat OCD? Uh, we have we have a, a member who has, uh, he, I have depression, PTSD, anxiety disorder, but the OCD is what's kicking, kicking his ass. <laughs> Excuse yes. my language. Huh. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I didn't mention some of the other disorders like OCD, like uh, eating disorders, you know, binging, purging, these sorts of things. Ketamine can definitely be useful in those spaces. Um, it's helpful to like all the medicines that we work with. It's really important to be, have kind of active therapy that you're also involved with, whether we're helping you in the clinic itself, but almost all of my clients have a therapist that they're working with too. And so, uh, you know, with OCD, with eating disorders or other things, there are some specific behavioral techniques that you can use to also, to also help people get better and, and to work through their illness. Uh, but there definitely are protocols out there using the types of doses we're using to help with OCD, uh, to help with eating disorders as well. Mm. Um, how long, so here's a question. How long should one wait after doing ketamine lozenges, uh, used your word there, uh, before doing uh, drinking ayahuasca? That question has never come up. Uh, but I can definitely answer it because it doesn't enter, you know, the big thing with ayahuasca with most of the psych meds is the, the ayahuasca vine itself has compounds in it that are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. It's what allows this, the DMT and the sacruna to work. Uh, it's that monoamine oxidase inhibitor though, that can cause a lot of the dangerous side effects that we see uh, with most psych meds. Um, ketamine doesn't have anything to do uh, with the types of things that you're worried about with monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The, there's no direct interaction with the drug itself, so you're not going to get some kind of higher dose or anything. Furthermore, the half-life of ketamine is really short. It's out of your system super quickly. So, so conceivably, you could do a ketamine infusion in the morning and do an ayahuasca ceremony that night. I, I have never talked with anyone who's done that. Um, it could be done, uh, but it's ask, it's asking a lot of your brain and your body. And so I might want to separate those by a couple of days, uh, but there at least isn't a reason why it would be unsafe or cause a dangerous side effect. Uh, so it could definitely be done, but you know, I, again, I'd want to see, okay, what, what's the real agenda here? What are we really trying to accomplish? Um, you know, maybe it's just someone who's 
really in a bad state with our suicidal ideation and we really want to do a one-two punch? Um, I don't know. It's a really good question. Mm. Uh, one more, one more question. Final question, guys. Um, this one is I've done four uh, cap cap treatments. I'm, uh, we went from cat to cap cap treatments with lozenges. Would Dr. Eric recommend using the rest of my lozenges twice a week until I'm done with the medication? I journeyed along with the first time last night. Thank you, cat. Okay. So whomever you're working with for the lozenge therapy, work with them in terms of like talk with them, see what they recommend. Um, so I, I don't want to sandwich myself between you and your therapist. Um, I would imagine that a twice a week lozenge session would be helpful. Uh, but again, I don't know all the details of your situation. I don't know exactly the kind of work that you've been doing with your therapist. And so it's important to have that dialogue with someone that has been walking with you through this journey. But, I, you know, if I had been working with you doing lozenge therapy, you know, ketamine assisted therapy or ketamine assisted psychotherapy, I think that's where the cap comes from. Uh, if I had been working with you and you'd gotten a good experience, my approach would be to continue you with twice a week lozenge therapy as long as it made sense. Not all therapists do that. Some people will use it just for a prescribed period of time to work through your trauma and then stop for a while. Because, I mean, let's face it, if we can deal with the trauma that we've accumulated over a lifetime, many times we don't need any antidepressants at all. Uh, if we get rid of that toxic residue, many times we can handle the rest of life has to throw at us. Not always, uh, but many times we can. And so, you know, it may be that maybe you don't need it anymore. I don't know. Again, I just don't know enough details of your situation to say for sure, but those are my thoughts. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Eric, for what an amazing presentation. You know, I love you. It's always great to have you on. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you, can you tell us um, how do we reach out to you? How do we connect with you? I know that Darlene had put it in the chat, but can you say it out loud? Where do we need to go? I'm going to put it in the chat box, but I'll tell you as so well. For those that are on other uh, other um, uh, platforms that are in the chat, like Facebook Live and on YouTube, how would they, in a recording, how would they find you? So infusionclinicocala.com. And so that's a, if I had picked another domain name, it might be better because <laughs> it's a mouthful. It's all one word, infusionclinicocala.com. And Ocala uh, is O-C-A-L-A. Yeah, or if you just type uh, if you just type ketamine Ocala in a Google search box, it'll bring that up as well. Mm -hmm. So that's another quick way of getting there. Um, my email address is eric at infusionclinicocala.com. Uh, I'm going to put that in the chat box. I'm going to put the web address in there too. You can also call our clinic. It's 352-325-5755. It's 352-325-5755. My front desk uh, person, Connor, is awesome. He can answer just about any question that you have. Um, uh, my medic also, uh, his name is Josh. Similar kudos to him. In addition to being an amazing IV starter, he's got a huge heart. He understands the medicine really well and can also answer your questions too. So those are the various ways you can get in touch. Um, and again, I'm... I'm one provider, there are a ton of ketamine providers out there. It's, it's a rapidly growing field. If you're in another part of the country, uh, another city, it's very easy to find ketamine clinics online. You just type ketamine clinic near me in, in Google or whatever search engine you use and you'll see. What I do encourage you to do, however, is look for the reviews. Not all clinics are the same. Some clinics are in it for the right reasons. They have big hearts. They walk the walk and they're there because they really care and other places just want to collect a big fat paycheck. And I don't mean to point fingers at anybody or anything like that, but due diligence, read the reviews, find out what people who've actually been there have to say before you trust yourself to someone in a situation like this. And hopefully they have an emphasis on uh, integration following your ketamine experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like any of the other medicines, uh, you know, the medicine is just part of it. And unless you do the work and work with what you've been given, you're really missing out and, and kind of wasting a lot of money, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, brother, thank you so much for being here today.